Uh, good evening, all. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce the speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Raghuveer Halkar, who has been a regular in all our webinars. He is the director of nuclear medicine in uh, Grady Memorial Hospital, and also the professor, Department of Radiology at the Emory University School of Medicine. He is a nuclear radiologist specializing in adrenal cancer, brain and spine tumors, neuroendocrine tumors, and thyroid cancer. He heads the Discovery and Developmental Therapeutics Research Program. He is a board certified nuclear med uh, medicine physician and has clinical expertise in uh, uh, tumor management, especially in thyroid and neuroendocrine tumors. He employs the uh, use of pain-free radioactive procedures to diagnose and treat illness. Professor Halker, he also serves as a, uh, in, among the board of directors of the Intersocietal Accreditation Committee and as a grant reviewer for the Department of Defense and National Institutes of Health Science uh, sections. Uh, brief about his education, um, he is uh, from Karnataka where he uh, earned his medical degree from the Government Medical College at Bellary. He also completed his internship there. Later on, he went on to obtain his MD from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS, in New Delhi. He then completed his residency in nuclear medicine at Emory University Hospital and conducted his PET fellowship at Creighton University in Omaha, in Nebraska. His areas of research interest is imaging and therapy with radio labeled folate. And he also um, is interested in developing new algorithms and software for image analysis for optimization of image acquisition and interpretation. Uh, he has authored several high impact uh, publications on a variety of topics, including salvage therapy, computer assisted interpretation, and so on. Uh, he has won several awards, including the Marshall Brewster Award from the Southeastern chapter of Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging in 2012 for his contributions to nuclear medicine. Today, he is going to enlighten us on the topic of imaging science. And uh, over to you, Dr. Hulker. Uh, thank you uh, for such a kind in introduction. And it's a pleasure to talk to you guys. And uh, uh, let me share the screen. Uh, will, will, they allow, will you guys allow me to? Oh, maybe I have the. One moment. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, it is uh, visible. Okay, uh, today the topic that I've chosen to talk about is something related to imaging science. The reason why I decided to talk about it is many of the textbooks uh, or regular lectures do not cover imaging science. We get a lot of lectures and information about physics and instrumentation and also about clinical uh, imaging, but not on imaging science. So I thought I will give some uh, my own experience with segmentation and edge detection in nuclear medicine. I have disclosures. I get royalties from quantum software for renal uh, imaging, uh, renal imaging analysis, and I am a reviewer for Inter Accreditation Society. Uh, and I want to dedicate this lecture to. Uh, Dr. R.D. Ganatra, uh, I'm sure some of you are his students or have heard about him. He was the president of Society of Nuclear Medicine India in 1973 
I'm sure most of you were not even born at that time. And quite often, he was a very humorous man. Quite often, he was in introduced in a meeting as a father of nuclear medicine in India. He would immediately reply, who is the, where is the mother? And he had a very good statement about who is a nuclear medicine physician. So he used to say, a, a physician, a nuclear medicine physician is a physician who talks clinical science to basic scientists and physics and instruments to clinician and knows neither of the two well. And I think it fits, this description fits me very well. Yes, we are bridges between scientists and clinicians. Yes, we are a good bridge. And like all bridges, people walk all, all over us. And I just want to, for those of you who have not read any one of his articles, I just want to give you a little glimpse of his wit and wisdom of Dr. Ganatra. He has written an, a fantastic article about medical statistics, and I have not found a better one. And here are the references, the two references. And Einstein used to say, God does not play dice when it comes to quantum mechanics. Einstein was not very fond of quantum mechanics, and he would say, God does not play dice. And Ganatra used to say, doctors, as doctors, when you are treating patients, sometimes we have to play dice. We have to make a decision, yes or no. We cannot hide behind statistics. We have to make a decision. So asked about what is the future of nuclear medicine, he had said that a worm that is exploring the dust does not know there are stars in the sky. And it's very, very appropriate. Let us say in 1970s, the future of nuclear medicine in India was very bleak. Indian economy was not good. It was very difficult to get isotopes and very difficult to get uh, gamma cameras and things like that, which were very, very expensive at that time. But now look at India. India is probably one of the leading countries when it comes to nuclear medicine. So we, it's very, very difficult to predict 50 in 50 years how the changes have taken place. And he always said, Nuclear medicine is not just images. Basically, what nuclear medicine is, laser kinetics. And there are a lot more to it than imaging. And that's very, very true. And of course, Theranostic has proved that these tracers can be very potent and very powerful. And he was an extremely humorous man. And in 1970s and 80s, quality assurance was not a big term. Nowadays, quality assurance is thrown around every day, everywhere. So he used to say, when it comes to give a talk on quality assurance, he used to say, quality assurance is like sex. Everyone says, I do it every day and take time and enjoy it. But the truth is far from, the, from that what one says. But he always used to say, QA should be in one's mind all the time. So that was the wit and wisdom of Dr. Kanatra. And if any one of you youngsters want to look at these two papers, it will be a very interesting read. So now the today's topic in proper is segmentation in image processing. Uh, segmentation can be also called as edge detection, but a broader term is segmentation and a specific term, a specific part of segmentation is edge detection. Segmentation is a process that partitions the image in portions that can give more information in less time during interpretation and help quantify the image findings. These days images in any image, there are hundreds of images. In CT, the slices are becoming thinner and thinner. We are in PET, we are doing whole body imaging routinely. So we have to see a lots of data in those images. And having some sort of segmentation minimizes your uh, time to interpret. And here you can see in a uh, scan, you can very clearly differentiate cortex from the white matter, gray matter from the white matter. In nuclear medicine, we can put kidney region of interest and generate renogram curves and develop quantification of right to left function, T1 halves and everything. But without this segmentation, it would be difficult to develop the curves and develop uh, quantitative parameters. Of course, those who have done Y90 therapy, you know we routinely calculate the tumor volume and the liver volume using one or the other type of segmentation techniques. Segmentation and edge detection in imaging, why and how? Here in this image, you can see 
the computer is automatically tracking the endocardial and epicardial border. And because it does this, then we can assess and diastolic volume and end systolic volume, and then we can calculate ejection fraction. So how does the computer track the epicardial endocardial board? There are many different algorithms. And I don't say one algorithm is better than the other. I would say one has to know what the algorithm does. Once you know what the algorithm does, then you can overcome the deficiencies of those algorithms. No algorithm is perfect, and every algorithm has strengths and weaknesses. And if you know the strengths and weaknesses of each algorithm, then you will be in a best position to understand which algorithm is better for which clinical condition. So before going to this, first let us look at how images which we interpret have evolved. Um, I have been in nuclear medicine in, since 1977. So I have seen how the images have evolved. So in olden days, when I joined, most of our images were analog images. They were on an X-ray film. Even nuclear medicine images, most of them were on an X-ray film or a 35 millimeter film roll. But now all images are digital. The old radiographic films were called analog images. Analog means continuous variable. Digital means discrete variable. So if you think about pure physics, everything in physics, matter, energy, and everything is, is discrete variables. And in quantum mechanics, that's what it says. Everything is in quantum. And once everything is digitized, it's very easy to quantify anything. So let me show you how a planar image nowadays, even a chest film is a matrix of pixels, whereas a tomographic image is a matrix of uh, voxels. So this is a voxel and this is a pixel. So digital nature of images leads to easy quant quantitation. All findings in an image these days can be quantified. We don't have to give any descriptive analysis of anything. We don't have to see there is a uh, solid nodule. We can even exactly tell what is the Hounsfield field of that uh, nodule. We can, same in the PET, we don't have to say there is an hypermetabolic focus. We, we can say exactly how much is the SUV. Are they absolutely correct? Not necessarily, but are they better than Descriptive language, certainly better than descriptive language. So why quantify findings? Basically, by quantifying, you increase the reproducibility. Because if I say it's a solid nodule versus subsolid nodule or a ground glass opacity, instead, if I give a household image, whatever I'm giving, the next person who reads it also will get the same number. So there won't be any confusion between these terminologies that we use to describe a lesion. So this increased reproducibility decreases inter-observer variability. And that's a very, very important finding or a, a parameter in clinical management. We, do, we want to have a good inter-observer uh, um, um, reliance or reproducible results. And especially it is much, much more important when we are comparing old scan to the new scan. So what is involved in quantitation in nuclear medicine per se? For a planar image, we put a region of interest. For a tomographic in image, we put a volume of interest. And from this region of interest and volume of interest, we derive parameters that quantify a lesion. So to put a region of interest, we can use manual placement of region of interest. But manual placement has one problem that it can have interoperator variability and it can decrease reproducibility. One can put a loose region of interest versus one can put a tight region of interest. Then it may change the average uh, SUVs. So exactly for this reason, to minimize the interoperator variability to an, increase the reproducibility in positron emission tomography, when we calculate SUE or when we dictate SUVs, we use the max SUV. 
because the max SUV is uh, not dependent on the size of the region of interest. A loose region of interest also will give you the max, the same max, and the uh, tight region of interest also will give you the same max SUV. So you can we can imagine why we use max SUVs in our reports, whereas in radiology, when it comes to Hounsfield units, they use average because radiological images have a high resolution like CT scan, and they can put a region of interest quite tightly and there is less interoperator variability. That's why they use an average, whereas we use max SUV, max SUV in our reports. But in spite of, apart from putting manual region of interest, if you can put the region of, region of interest or volume of interest automatically, then it will minimize the interoperator variability. So how ROI or VOR are placed automatically? How can we get volume of liver lobes and tumors uh, in during Y90 therapies? So most of the time we use a technique called edge detection, especially in nuclear medicine, we use edge detection. Well, edge detection is a way of segmentation. There are many, many different ways for segmenting. And of course, nowadays, artificial intelligence, neural networking are doing a great job in segmenting many different things. So let us restrict ourselves to what is being used in edge detection behind the scenes in nuclear medicine processing. So definition of an edge and use of an edge detection. Definition of an edge is a discontinuous intensity. Whenever there is, each pixel has a certain intensity. And if there is a continuous intensity, there is no edge. If the intensities are same between the pixels, there is no edge. The moment the intensities change significantly from one pixel to the next pixel, then we can define an edge. Most of the studies in NM quantify physiological process by placing ROI or VOI over the area of interest. For example, when you are measuring gallbladder rejection fraction, the technologist has to put a region of interest over gallbladder. Renogram curves and parameters, technologists have to put a region of interest over kidney. PET CT for tumor SUV, a volume of interest is mostly placed over the lesion. So different techniques of automatic edge detection used in nuclear medicine. I'm sure most of you know it, and at least in US, it's occasionally a bold question. Uh, so there is threshold method, there is point of inflection method, hybrid method, gradient method. Of late, there are newer methods called phase analysis, factor, and fractals. And we'll go over uh, all of them one by one uh, in a brief way. I, I can't go into the details of every one of these methods. And I'm also not an expert, as I'm telling you. So I'm more of a clinician. So uh, this is a percentage threshold method by where, for example, quantum uh, software uses a threshold method. Operator places a wide uh, circle over the organ and pixel with highest counts is identified in the kidney. And over all the pixels with certain number of percentage threshold of the highest pixel. So a region is drawn depending on the percentage threshold from the highest pixel. The highest pixel, let us say, has 100 counts in a pixel. And if I tell the computer use a 30% threshold, it will search in all this area and try to find any pixels that has more than 30 counts and put the region in, of interest clustering all those pixels. That's how it is done. But the question comes, how do we decide whether 30% is a good threshold or a 20% is a good threshold? So it is determined by there are many different ways to do it, but one of the ways we have done is have three to five experience user draw the ROI over the kidney. And then we'll ask the computer to use 5%, 10%, 25%, 20%, 25%, 25%, and 30% threshold, or even 35 if you want to, and see which one of these thresholds match very well with the uh, readers expert readers or expert drawers. So that's how we, in quantum, we tried from five to 50% and we, we came up with a 30% threshold gives a 
best region of interest. So many programs use 50% threshold and some of the software in, in olden days, the Cedar sinai QPS, QGS used 50% threshold for cardiac, epicardial and endocardial border detection. Of course, now they have changed and the things have evolved significantly. Other uses of threshold method is automatic ROI in MAGA. MAGA also uses uh, different other methods too. So here is a way just to explain it. If you take a profile over a uh, MAGA image and you will get a curve like this. So this is the right ventricle, this is the septum, and this is the left ventricle peak. And we can take the peak value and put say 50% or 75% should be the edge. And it will detect the edge of the right ventricle and edge of the left, left ventricle. There is a gradient method that is used in uh, MAGA scan too. In that, uh, it goes and searches radially all over. And once, let us say from the peak value, a certain threshold is reached, that point is considered as the edge. And it will join all the points and create an edge. So that's a gradient method. So six to 36 vectors from the center with certain threshold are used to create ROI. Threshold works very well when the target to background ratio is high. If the target to background ratio is poor, like in a poor functioning kidney, the top row, the kidney function is good in both bilaterally and automatic ROI created the ROI very well. But in the bottom row, the left kidney, doesn't have a good count rates or good function. And the computer is struggling to put a good region of interest over the left kidney. So in many physiological imaging, as the function of the organ goes down, then the threshold method fails to correctly detect the edge. There is a method called point of inflection or a second derivative method. Second derivative is, is the change in rate of change. For example, in this curve, if it is coming down and then the rate changes, it becomes less and less. This is the point of inflection. And here it is the point of inflection. For example, it's coming down, but then it became flat. So the rate of change has become very less. So that's the second derivative. Those who are in banking, or in finance would know what is a second derivative and could have been burned by that. So that point is the inflection point. So some softwares use either a particular threshold or use an uh, inflection. So that's the hybrid method. Either a given threshold, 20% or 30%, whatever has been decided will be used from the peak value or point of inflection, whichever comes first, that will be used. And that method is called hybrid method. In oncological imaging, when you do a whole body PET CT and a um, tomographic images, you need to pr produce volume of interest or place a volume of interest to get the information, not a region of interest. So if you are using a volume of interest, then there are many different methods in the volume of uh, interest. And by that you can assess total lesion glycolysis, not only just maximum SUV, I'm sure some of you have used total lesion glycolysis, how it makes a difference when you are comparing old scan to new scan. The SUV might have changed or come down, but the total lesion glycolysis might have gone up because the tumor grew in size, but the SUV has gone down, but the total lesion glycolysis has, has increased. So there are many algorithms for uh, total, uh, for calculating the tumor volume. And there are many of them are AI based. Some of them are not AI based. Some of them are gradient method. Uh, and I, I will not go into the details of every method. So there are certain issues about uh, volume of interest and the currently available uh, methods to some of them use 50% uh, as the way to define an edge, 
that can be detrimental if uh, the SUV has significantly dropped. For example, pre-treatment, if the SUV was 20, if you use you, using 50% as a threshold, then it will, the region of interest will only include pixels that have maximum SUV more than 10. But then after treatment, if the SUV has gone down to five, and then it will use 50%, it will include all the pixels that have SUV more than 2.5. So it may not be apple to apple comparison. So one has to be careful. So now there are other newer methods that have come into picture. For that, you have to understand spatial and frequency spaces. Every image data can be converted from spatial domain to frequency domain. Once it is in frequency space, phase of the wave can have an additional information. And I'll tell you, I'll show you how. This is a Mugus image. And this is in the spatial domain. It can be converted into frequency domain. It would look like this. And from frequency domain, it can be, this frequency domain is shown as a graphic picture here. Here it is shown as an image where there is the brightest point here. And it can be converted into spatial domain back again. And we do this routinely in every tomographic reconstruction. The image is going, moving from spatial domain to frequency domain, and then we turn it back to spatial domain. So difference between spatial domain and frequency domain. Spatial domain deals with the images as it is. The value of the pixel of the image change with the respect to scene. Whereas in frequency domain, it deals with the rate at which the pixel values are changing in spatial domain. So that's how it works. But why do you want to do this? Because it's easy to filter. It is easy to manipulate an image in frequency domain much faster than the spatial domain. So once it is an image is in the frequency domain, as you can see, a wave, these are two waves, they are identical. They have the same wavelength, in turn the same frequency, because wavelength and frequency are inverse to one another. They have the same amplitude, but the wave in pink is different than wave in the uh, blue color. They are out of phase or they are in different phase. That's what we mean by phase. So how does this relate to edge detection? So here is a first pass study. And you can see the first pass study. And in this case, fortunately, you can sadly say here is the aortic wall. But somebody may say, is this the aortic wall here? Or in some other cases, you may see a continuous flow tract and it will be very difficult to, for a technology to say where to put the aortic wall to calculate the EF from the left ventricle. And he doesn't want to include the aorta because if you include the aorta, your EF will drastically fall down. You will get a spurious EF calculation. So, uh, One moment, sorry for that. So if you convert this first pass image into a phase image, you will see very clearly that the phase image shows very clearly where the aortic wall is. Here, it's a no brainer now. So phase image tells you all the pixels in the left ventricle is in green, all the pixels in the aorta are in, are in red because, and this is a phase histogram. And that's because the pixels that cover the left ventricle are losing blood. And when they are losing blood, pixels in the aorta are gaining blood. So they are out of phase and the phase image very, easily uh, shows where the edge of the left ventricle is. So phase image is a very powerful tool to assess uh, edges. 
and segmentation. And this is possible in a dynamic image. It's not necessarily possible in all the um, um, So there are other uses of phase in an, uh, analysis. I'm sure you know about it. This is a patient uh, who has had a EF calculation with MAGA, a radionuclear equil equilibrium uh, scan. And here you can say the phase histogram, instead of being a tight uh, ventricle and atrial, it is different. So for example, this is the atrium and this is the ventricle, but the right ventricle has a different color than the left. That means right ventricle is not in phase with the left ventricle. This patient has a left bundle branch block. And this patient you can see here, you, you can say that the EF is not so good by looking at this Im uh, dynamic image but you won't be able to tell whether there is a, definitely tell there is an aneurysm or not in the apex. Whereas the phase image shows a different phase in the apical, enteroapical portion of the left ventricle. And that is a telltale sign of an aneurysm. So phase images do help a great deal in making diagnosis. So phase is one way of segmenting the image. And it not only helps in putting the region of interest correctly, but also aids in uh, uh, diagnosis and making the diagnosis more confident. Factor analysis. Factor analysis is an another extension of uh, phase analysis. Uh, some of the computers, softwares, especially coming from France, have, have used factor analysis extensively. So let us say in left ventricle assessment, function assessment, it was straightforward, easy. Whereas if you are looking at a renogram or renal images, dynamic images, uh, if you use phase image in a renogram, you can create a phase image in renogram too. You will, you will have multiple, multiple phases because the cortex has one phase, collecting system comes later, then the pelvis, then the ureter. So you will have a mirad of phases in the renal image. And it may not help you. Having too many segmentations also is counterproductive. You want physiologically meaningful segmentation of an image. For example, I would like to have a cortical region of interest and one collecting system and pelvis, and maybe one other one as ureter. Not more than three segmentation in the kidney. If you do 20 segmentation of the kidney, it will be too difficult to interpret anything. So factor analysis, these clusters, these variables, and puts it into two or three factors. And how many factors you have to use depends on what sort of physiological process you are looking at and what, do you, what are you trying to obtain from those images. So that's where the factor analysis, and you can get quite a few uh, uh, factor analysis papers in the literature, in, even in Journal of Nuclear Medicine, way back 10 to 15 years. And some of the softwares use factor analysis to put automatic region of interest in the renogram. Now, the latest one is fractals. I'm sure some of you have heard about fractals or have seen nice pictures of fractals in the internet. And this is one of them. And fractal is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, the term fractal was first used by mathematician Bernard Vanderbilt in 1975. So it's only 50 years old. In mathematics, a fractal is a self-similar subset of Euclidean space whose fractal dimension strictly exceeds its topographical dimension. Fractals appear the same at different levels as illustrated in successive magnifications of the Mandelbrot set. This is one of them. What fractals basically means is a macro mimics micro. Uh, so that is the basis of fractal. And fractal has been used in many, many different uh, uh, application. And fractals are used in predicting stock market and edge detection. Uh, so if the stock market is losing slowly or gaining slowly, maybe the next future will be it will gain. So that's how 
the fractals work. And you can find a few articles, quite a few articles about MR imaging using fractal analysis for differentiating primary CNS lymphoma and glioblastoma. So a fractal in nuclear medicine, I have not seen many papers using fractals in edge direction or segmentation. So the next uh, 10 minutes I will spend on what is the contribution of Emory University to this region of interest placement, automatic region of interest placement, or edge detection or segmentation. First question is to ask, do we need to detect edges to place region of interest? Not necessarily. It is actually easy to detect the peak than the edge. Modeling a, pri a, pri a priori knowledge of the structure you are planning to find the edge for left ventricular wall one centimeter and use finite resolution effect to see changes in thickness in end systole and diastole were used in Emory cardiac toolbox to detect the epicardial and endocardial borders. Uh, so for that, you may have to understand that below three spatial resolution, change in intensity of an object is proportional to change in thickness. This is called as finite resolution effect. So especially for tomographic, it is below times three spatial resolution. For planar, it is below times two. Uh, Tracy Faber, uh, she's late Tracy Faber, she was an fantastic physicist at working at Emory and made this big contribution of developing a new algorithm for edge detection. So at Emory, in Emory Cardiac Toolbox, the epicardial endocardial borders are using a centroid method and a modeling approach to uh, create this automatic region of interest placement, not by really detecting the edge, like any one of the methods that I showed you earlier. And I will come to that in a moment. So first in Emory Cardiac Toolbox, in the image of the left ventricle, it detects the centroid that the peak counts. And in normal, it goes ahead and puts endocardial border and epicardial border five millimeter away from the peak on either side, assuming that one centimeter is the thickness of the myocardium and an average thickness of the myocardium. Uh, myocardium thickness varies between end diastole and end, end systole. So, but then in every frame, depending on the change in the intensity, the border is adjusted. And here it uses a result of, uh, it's a finite resolution effect it uses. And what, what is the finite resolution effect? And I will tell you about it in a moment. How does it differ from partial volume effect? In the literature also, quite often partial volume effect and finite resolution effect are combined or they're used interchangeably. They are totally two different phenomenon. Uh, I just want to ask a question for you. Any one of you have heard about finite resolution effect? Feel free to say, uh, but anyway, I'll go ahead. Finite resolution effect is lumped in partial volume effect in many articles and in the literature. At the best, finite resolution is a special case of partial volume effect. So here is an eight millimeter thick uh, slice CT and here is one millimeter and you see the resolution and all the structures much better in thinner slices. Same in MRI, uh, thicker cut versus thinner cut. You see the resolution improves significantly. And this phenomenon in radiology, they, we call it as volume averaging or partial volume effect. Partial volume artifact occurs when portions of the several objects are averaged together in a slice. The result is impaired spatial resolution and erroneous signal intensity. And this can be overcome by thin slices. So here is an in injection. This is a, uh, an example. Here is a uh, lung nodule. And in this, it looks pretty uh, dense. And then in this one, this slice, it looks less. And it's because, not because this area is less dense than this area, just because it's, it's partially occurring in, in this particular slice thickness. And if you 
in, increase the number of slices or decrease the slice thickness, these differences can be overcome. The same, again, an uh, example. The partial volume or volume averaging can be overcome by using thinner slices. But finite resolution of effect occurs below three times the system resolution. And this is a unique problem for nuclear images mainly. CT is not much of an issue. CT and MR have in the eggshell plane, they have very good resolution. So they don't encounter it much very often. Whereas for us, it's very common because SPECT and PET have, in an ideal situation, we have five to eight millimeter resolution. So uh, and, and objects below 1.5 centimeter get affected by finite resolution effect. That's why we say PET CT, FDG uptake may be underestimated in a uh, tumor less than 1.5 centimeter or one centimeter, depending on the system that you use. And I'll give you some example. For example, here is the left ventricular uptake and here is the faint right ventricular uptake. In fact, right ventricle gets the same blood supply as left ventricle. Per gram per minute, the right ventricle gets the same blood amount of blood as the left ventricle. But the, we don't see right ventricle or we see very faint outline of uh, right ventricle. And it's because the left ventricle is thick and the right ventricle is very thin. In a patient who has a thick right ventricle or a pulmonary hypertension or situs inversus or, or uh, you know, uh, great vessel uh, changes, that may give you a right ventricle as bright as uh, left ventricle. So right ventricular wall thickness is uh, two to three millimeter, whereas left ventricular is eight millimeter. So that's why you are seeing the difference in intensity. This, this is a good example of finite resolution effect. So let us say in five years time, a gamma camera comes, which has a resolution of one millimeter, then you will see the right ventricle as bright as the left ventricle. In fact, there are some uh, animal uh, cameras uh, that have uh, resolution of a millimeter and millimeter and a half. And in that, the right and the left ventricle would look the same brightness. Same in and, uh, and systolic and, and diastolic intensity. So technician may be image and diastolic pictures and systolic pictures. Maybe is a fixed agent. There is no change in the concentration of radio tracer in the myocardium, but the myocardium looks less bright in and diastole, whereas it looks brighter in end systole, because in end diastole, myocardium is thinner, and in end systole, myocardium is thicker. So if I can, if we can see how much the thick, uh, intensity change then I can say how much thicker it became. And we can use this model to detect the endocardial border and, and the epicardial border. That's what the nuclear medicine, uh, the memory cardiac toolbox uses in detecting the endocardial and epicardial border. So basically, finite resolution is a negative point in nuclear medicine imaging. And Dr. Faber, use that negative point to her advantage to create a new software or a new algorithm to use to detect edges. So just to highlight on finite resolution, this is a phantom study. This is a PET CT uh, image of the same amount of FDGs per ml, uh, per millicury per ml. The same stock solution of FDG is introduced in all these five uh, tubes. As you can see, as the tube size becomes thinner and thinner diameter, the intensity becomes less and less. And here is a uh, graph of those intensities. As you can see, the intensity is going down. And this is a very systematic process. If, uh, if I know the resolution of a system or a gamma camera or a scanner, and if I know the size of these uh, uh, um, tubes, we can correct for it. And that's what the resolution recovery software does 
uh, in many types of iterative reconstruction these days, most of the PET scanners, uh, all vendors have developed resolution recovery softwares and they can, uh, even a smaller nodule will maintain the fidelity of its FDG concentration. So that's how uh, we use uh, the centroid and the finite resolution effect, which is a negative point, but used to our advantage to create endocardial and epicardial border. And it has worked reasonably well. But there is a problem with centroid model. Uh, that's because, and final finite resolution effect. Finite resolution effect, the negative effect goes away once the organ of interest is more than the three times your resolution. Let us say you have five millimeter resolution to your fantastic camera. And if the myocardium, left ventricular myocardium is two centimeter in a hyper, uh, tensive cardiac myop myocardi cardiac myopathy, a thicker myocardium, then the memory cardiac toolbox fails. So be careful about reading EF in a patient who has a very thick myocardium using memory cardiac toolbox. Okay. If the object is more than the three times of the resolution, then the algorithm doesn't work. In reality, most of the edge detections work in around 80% of the time, but they fail in about 20% because of poor target to background ratio, motion, and as I discussed earlier, the modeling fails, okay? So the use of a region grow to assess liver volume is used routinely in MIM software. AI-based segmentation, a topic for another time. It's a big topic and a lot of neural networks. And the larger your data uh, to train the AI-based segmentation, the more effective it will be. So in summary, why use quantification while reporting results of images? Different methods currently available for segmentation and detection, finite resolution effect and emory way of determining and endo and epicardial borders automatically. That's what I've covered. And um, what I'm going to say is, uh, as, uh, as most of our nuclear medicine images are digitized, quantification is, will be increasing year by year. And I'm sure in the next uh, uh, decade, we'll be using more uh, objective and less uh, interoperator variability in our reporting. So for youngsters in the audience, associate with a good IT person, come up with a new edge detection algorithm, which works every time, then you can retire. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harker. It was a wonderful talk. <laughs> and even Dutch like me were able to understand the basics of segmentation. Uh, so the forum is now open for uh, questions. Completely new area, I think. And um... yeah, it it, it it is. That's what I thought because I looked up a uh, lot of uh, YouTube's and internet. There's so much about physics and everything else. Their instrumentation, and I thought. Imaging science is one that is not very well covered uh, right now in the internet. And um, many of the standard textbooks uh, do not have extensive uh, information about it. Absolutely, yes. What about the accuracy of these uh, segmentation? As you said, there can be different there are a host of algorithms that are available. Uh, so yes. um, how do we go about... Uh, choosing the right one in terms of uh, the accuracy of <laughs> as i told you there is no right one because every vendor these days gives you some some tools so uh -huh. uh, so the question becomes like this is you have to understand the vendor's um, program and what algorithm the vendor has used uh, one and find out the strength and weaknesses and overcome it because for example, you have GE and that has given you uh, some software. You have nothing mm -hmm. else. You can't go ahead and invent a new one at all. 
Uh, so then I can tell you one thing uh, um, that can help is anytime you use a new software or a new algorithm in a, uh, from a company, ask the company people to provide you a white paper. And usually a white paper will have some description of what goes on into that software. They will not give you all the details because it's proprietary and they will guard it. Uh, they won't give you all the details, but they will give you salient features. Okay. Uh, and that will help you to decide. And if one other thing, don't blindly say some a vendor comes and say, here is the best software I'm giving you. Don't buy, uh, do yourself a test in your own clinic. Uh, let three of your people use that and see the interoperator variability and deficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, or use this, that software for a patient with a 500, 350 pounds, 200 pounds or 100 pounds. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you are not finding those many more than 350 pounds in, in India, but in US it's not an uncommon occurrence, but I'm sure India is catching up even in that field also, <laughs> because India is catching up, I'm sure in every field. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so those are those are the techniques that I use uh, whenever a software or a vendor gives me a software, I test it by myself and I insist on getting a white paper. In US, most of the software have to go through an FDA approval called 510K uh, because if there is an error in the software and because of that error, if I make made a clinical uh, judgment that is wrong and if I'm sued, I, uh, they have to justify it. So uh, the um, one of, if you are buying equipment from US, you can always ask whether it's fight and K approved. That's one way okay. of uh, uh, making sure that you are in good shape. Thank I you. Think I have um, something in the chat here. Um, yeah. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Yeah, my name is Abhinav Jha. Uh, so thank you for this talk, Dr. Harkar. Uh, it's very informative. Actually, spec segmentation, I think, is a very important area of research. And my own research is in the computational aspects of uh, developing uh, uh, computational medical imaging algorithms with focus on PET and spec. Um, I, I also I fully agree with you that I think quantification is going to become even more important going forward. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the previous question related to evaluation of these algorithms. Uh, you showed Dr. Faber's work on using phantom studies. Uh, one of the things that we have been thinking about uh, deeply is evaluation of segmentation algorithms with patient data and demonstrating the reliability with patient data. Uh, as a physician, what kinds of evidence would you like to see in order for uh, you to be able to say, okay, I want to use this segmentation algorithm compared to some other. So I'm asking this question more as a researcher and as a PhD who is interested in developing these algorithms. What are the kinds of evidence that you would like to see? Uh, uh, very good. Um, um, yes, uh, phantom studies are great and phantom studies, you know the truth because you have introduced all the yes. uh, amount of, but then they have limitations. There are no phantoms that mimic uh, uh, anthropomorphic body in the mm -hmm. sense that we cannot create a phantom and, and human body is so variable. So it's always good to do in, uh, in real patient studies. But the mm -hmm. problem comes is, how do you know what is the truth? Yeah. So yeah. there are two ways to, uh, two things I can tell you. One is you can certainly check the reproducibility. You can give it to five people. You can give mm -hmm. it to a resident and attending a 10 year uh, technologist who has experience with it and see uh, what level of expertise and how the software performs when it comes to a wide range of users mm. and wide range of patients, a mm. small, thin patient with motion and without motion, check all those things. So okay. you can do, do experiments in patient studies, mm -hmm. take 10 cases where there is patient motion and see how the software has worked, the segmentation has worked in with motion. Okay. Large patients, uh, less uh, weight patients and things like that. 
there is one another way to but this only tells you reproducibility does not tell you the accuracy accuracy so, right. so to accuracy that is one way is for example uh, that you need a help of a surgeon so mm -hmm. for example there is a liver tumor that he is going to resect and you mm -hmm. have used segmentation and let him give you the exact dimension of the specimen gross specimen after surgery before mm -hmm. Uh, the pathologist completely destroyed. You mm -hmm. ask the surgeon to give you, then you can compare the size obtained by segmentation versus mm -hmm. the actual size of the surgical specimen. That mm -hmm. is a, that's a good way to do it. For that, mm -hmm. you have to associate with a surgeon and make mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and unfortunately or fortunately, these days, many uh, surgical role in, for example, liver or larger tumor resection is becoming less and less because mm. most of them go for Y90 therapy or some other therapy. Yes. So yeah. is the case with lung tumors and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you, there is a way for uh, to, to do one other thing is for renal, for example, do a renogram pre-transplant and see the size and test it on when the surgeon takes out the kidney for donor kidney and puts it into the... Uh, so it, basically what I'm saying is to check the accuracy in patients, you need the help of the surgeon. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the response. Or, uh, you can do a large animal study. Mm -hmm. I don't know how strong are the animal activists in India. You can do uh, pigs or larger animals and mm -hmm. can see how your segmentation matches with the but the truth. Sure. Yeah. Actually, I'm at Washington University here. So, oh, okay. uh, Louis at Wash U. Uh, so, yeah, I have uh, come across, like, for example, studies with pigs. But one of the things that I'm, I haven't been sure about is if ex vivo measurements, how much does that correlate to an in vivo, uh, specifically for nuclear medicine? Like, I could, we could do auto rad studies, for example, but I haven't been really fully sure about the correlations in the quantitative okay. parameters. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah, we have done a few, you know, pig studies, and we have the data. And uh, Tracy Faber mm -hmm. has used uh, pig studies to cal uh, use some of her uh, proof of the algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you once again. I really enjoyed your talk. I look forward to following up. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. A any further questions? Well. Oh, somebody has, has said very good comment. Zoom has also used to edge detection technique to blur your background of Salka. <laughs> that is oh, very, yes. <laughs> very, uh, you know, um, uh, edge detection is much more in Hollywood and in games. Uh, most of the uh, computer games use uh, edge detection very effectively. So, in fact, um, we, we have to par uh, partner with that kind of IT people. Uh, actually, uh, in US, most of the brightest minds in uh, um, IT goes to developing games, which, which has more money than anything else. Now, the bottom portion comes to medical sciences. Absolutely. <laughs> not, the, not the cream, the cream. They won't come to medicine because we won't pay them much. Oh, yes. Thank you, Rishani. I think all of us feel the same way. Thank you very much, sir, for us to wonderful talk. Okay, I think all you. of us learned a lot. Uh, it is um, it's something that's very important. And I think you dealt with that uh, very complex uh, scenario. with very simple uh, building up, you know, gradually starting from a pixel and voxel. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I think in the absence of any further question, um, uh, thank you. Let us all join together to thank Dr. Halker. And uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks again and bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. <laughs>